net of strings we have up over our heads right now. It would be nice if it was a thought catcher. Your thoughts go wandering off, they hit the net, and come right back. But it doesn't work that way. You have to be on top of your own mind. When a thought goes off, you have to remember, that's not what you want to follow. You can just let it go. We're so used to wanting to know every little thing that's going on in the mind that it takes a while to realize that that's not really our duty. We don't have to keep track of everything. We don't have to keep tabs on everything. Just because a thought appears in the mind doesn't mean that it's worthy of our attention. And we don't have to be afraid we're going to miss out on anything important. Right now it's time to meditate, time to focus in on the breath, to have one object for the mind. And to remember to stay here. It's the remembering that makes all the difference. This is why mindfulness is such an important quality, and why it's so important that we understand mindfulness is a quality of the memory, a quality of the active memory that keeps things in mind that you want to apply to what you're doing right now. Otherwise, your meditation loses direction. You could be in the present moment, and who knows where the present moment would take you. And it may be a change of pace from your normal thinking, but it doesn't really accomplish that much. We always want to keep the issues of appropriate attention in mind. In other words, you see things in terms of skillful and unskillful, and from there you split skillful and unskillful into the Four Noble Truths. There's an unskillful thought or type of thinking, i.e. craving and clinging, that leads to an undesirable result, which is suffering and stress. There are skillful thoughts, skillful mind qualities, which are the path, and they lead to desirable results which is the cessation of suffering. And each of those categories has a duty. Any meditation that teaches you just one duty, like noting or scanning or being with the present, really misses out one of the, on one of the important teachings, which is that you're shaping things right now. You're not just a passive observer of what comes up, comes up, comes up. You're actually encouraging certain things to come up, and you're completing them, turning them into an actual experience. And some of the things coming up are things you want to comprehend, and other things are things you want to let go of right away as soon as you recognize them. Still others are things you want to develop. So you've got to keep in mind, you've got those duties. As for the cessation of suffering, that's something you want to realize, something you want to witness for yourself. So you've got four duties in all. You want to keep in mind the fact that when something comes up, you want to be able to classify it into one of those four categories so you can know what to do with it. And then you want to learn how to stay with that frame of mind. So when you're focusing on the breath, any thought that's related to the breath, any awareness of the breath, that's something to be developed. And how long do you want to develop it? Well, you work on it. You're here for an hour. And if you find that you can't stick with it for the entire hour, at least try to lengthen the amounts of time you are with the breath. When you're sitting on your own. It's good to give yourself a minimum amount of time that you want to stay. But don't get too firmly wedded to the idea that you're going to have to stop at the end of that a lot of time. Sometimes things are going really well at the end of the meditation. And then you can just tell yourself, well, they're going well, I'm going to stick with it. You're not committed to stopping. There's a sad story I read of a 
Western monk had gone to stay with a Chan Cha, and he had decided he would give himself five years and see how things were at the end of the five. And things were going okay, but somehow it had gotten embedded in his mind that five years was it. No good reason at all. So don't get too wedded to the idea that you're just going to sit here for the hour. When you're here with a group, of course, you want to fit in with the manners of the group. But when you're sitting on your own, you can set a minimum amount of time and then say, I'm going to stick with it for at least that amount of time. And if it's going well at the end, or in the midst of something really interesting happening in the mind, okay, stick with it. Stay there. And then at that point, part of the mind is, okay, when will you end? Like little kids saying, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And if you want the little kids to run your mind, okay, then you get in a conversation with them. But if you don't, you say, well, we'll see. We'll just stick with it, stick with it. Each breath, one at a time, one at a time. In other words, don't make the clock the determiner of your meditation. Use it to help you with the minimum amount of time you want to give to it. But as for the maximum, leave that as an open question. And this way you're training the unskillful voices in the mind, the, one things, the ones that want things tied up in neat little packages, and neat little boxes. As a John Fuhrer once commented, we live in times. The day gets chopped up into little tiny times. As a result, we don't get to see the timeless. So you want to make the whole day your time to meditate and divide it up into walking and sitting and lying down as you see fit. But the part of the mind that wants everything neatly divided up like that, you will learn how to resist it, rebel against it a little bit, so that it doesn't take over. You want your concentration to take over. You want your framework of appropriate attention to take over. And you want to develop the skill of being able to stay with something just step by step by step without thinking about how long you've been here or how much longer you will be here. Because your ability to resist that kind of conversation is going to come in really handy when you're dealing with pain. Whether it's pain in the meditation or pain that comes from a disease or whatever. Once there's pain and you start thinking about how long the pain has been there, you've added an extra burden on the mind. The pain didn't add that burden. The pain from five minutes ago, or five seconds ago, it's gone. But you want to carry it. Think about a John Lee's image of the, the farmer who is plowing the field and has a big bag to put all the dirt that falls off the plow into the bag. If his water buffalo has to drag that, after all, the water buffalo won't be able to drag anything anymore. It gets weighed down. And if on top of that you think about all the dirt that you're going to be plowing, where are you going to find a bag for that? And yet that's what the mind does. One is, how much longer is this pain going to last? It's been lasting now for five minutes, ten minutes, it's been lasting for an hour, it's lasted for two days. When is it going to stop? And if you can learn how to end that conversation, just refuse to get involved in that conversation, you've learned an important skill. Because it's conversations like this that place limitations on the mind. The same as when you make a vow that you're going to sit for a certain amount of time, or each day you're going to do walking meditation for a certain amount of time, and you're afraid to take the vow because you're afraid you won't be able to fulfill it. We've got to look at those voices that express their fear. One of John Fung's really effective ways of dealing with that was saying, is it going to kill me if I do this? Well, no. What's well, going to get in the way, then? And we find it's your laziness. Do you want to give in your laziness? You've given in to your laziness who knows how long, how many times. Now, where has it gotten you?
your fear that maybe this effort that you put in the practice is going to be bad for your health. Okay, you know your body's going to wear out anyhow. Have it wear out with a practice rather than wearing out with with a fear that it's going to wear out. Because whether you fear it or not, it's going to wear out. So you might as well use it in a good way before it wears out. And if it gets worn out to the practice, at least it's been worn out well, to some purpose. This is one of the values of taking a vow, is that you stir up some of these voices. And you have to learn how not to be afraid of the voices. Learn how to give them answers. Sometimes they can be flippant answers. Sometimes they can be serious answers. Sometimes the answers are effective if you have a little image to go with them. This is one of the reasons why reading a John Lee is not only entertaining but also really instructive. He's got a lot of good images in there, like the image of the water buffalo with a bag. Once you think about that, and you see that that's what you're doing, you realize how stupid it is. In this way you learn how to clear away this forest of fears and limitations that the mind creates for itself. And you do it step by step by step. You realize that they put up huge shadow puppets, basically. Little tiny puppets, but they cast huge shadows to scare you. But when you actually trace the shadow back to where it came from, it's usually just some little thought that just repeats itself over and over and over again. A little fear, a little uncertainty. Then you have to decide you don't want these things to take over your life. And again, it's usually the little children in your mind. I don't want to do this. Mommy, I don't want I don't like this. Try to listen to the tone of voice of the these voices in your mind. And sometimes you realize these are little kids. You're an adult now. They talk about listening to your inner child. Well, try to learn how to listen to your inner adult. You don't want the children in charge. You don't want the you want the adults in charge. The children throw up difficulties. Throw up in both senses of the term. And the skill of being an adult is learning how to cut those difficulties away. And sometimes it means just, you know, focusing right now, right now. Don't worry about how much long you're going to be here. Don't worry about how long you have been here. You've just got this moment right here, right here. Make sure you do this moment well. This way you don't give in to the children and you get, you get your work done. You can throw a little sop to the children, learn how to breathe skillfully. John Lee compares us to having some dolls for the kids to play with. You can play with the fire element, we can play with the earth element, the water element, and especially with the wind element, i.e. the breath energy in the different parts of the body. Those are the playthings for little kids in the mind. You can keep them entertained as you do your work.